let's talk about the big daddy of all things related to cognitive optimization, and that is sleep. If I were going to say the two most important things that you can do to optimize your cognition is sleep and eat right. Those are the big ones. But sleep is the one that will impact you the fastest. You could mess up your diet for a day, two days, maybe even a week before it really starts to hammer you. But man, you miss one night's sleep and there is a catastrophic cascade of biological problems that will present themselves rapidly. So somebody that gets, I think, less than six hours of sleep a night shows the same kind of blood glucose response as somebody who's pre-diabetic. So that gives you an idea of missing only part of one night's sleep can have that kind of massive cellular impact. So being incredibly thoughtful about getting your sleep is super important. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and I make these videos because when I started my first business, I really struggled to believe myself. I was making 300 bucks a month and quit on my business partner. And the thing that saved me was watching the stories of successful entrepreneurs. They gave me strategies as well as hope and belief that just maybe I could do it myself as well. And I hope that this video here today helps you get a little bit more belief in yourself because I still need the videos for myself today too. So today, let's master the basic fundamentals of life and success. Enjoy. As somebody who loves hustle porn and being hardcore and working an amazing amount, I do all of that with precious little negative impact to my sleep. I won't say that it never happens, especially not since I've gotten into NFTs. It is, there has been some wobble in my perfect sleep record, um, but it's really minor. And the reason that I do that is to me, being tired is a unique ring of hell. I do not understand people who are prepared to go their entire lives fatigued. It makes everything worse. Your ability to enjoy your life goes down. Your likelihood of being depressed goes way up. Your likelihood of having metabolic disturbances goes way up. There, there are just so many things go wrong. And then of course, the most traumatically impacted is your ability to think clearly and think quickly. If you've ever gone even one night with bad sleep, let alone two or three nights, you can feel yourself declining rapidly in performance. In fact, if you take somebody that hasn't gotten any sleep and put them in a car, they have the same sort of delays that somebody who's intoxicated has. So the impacts on cognition cannot be overstated. So be very careful. If you're trying to be at your best, and really perform at an elite level. The thing that you must do is get sleep. So make sure that you're prioritizing your sleep. Now, how do we do that? How do we get sleep done in a high quality way? Number one is you wanna make sure that you're sleeping in a completely dark environment. So no night lights, hopefully no even like charging lights or things like that. Now, one way I do to make myself absolutely bulletproof, not only do I have blackout curtains, but I sleep with the blankets completely over my head. Now, admittedly, it didn't start for reasons of light pollution, but now as I get older, I'm actually grateful that my whole life I've had this um, pattern of sleeping with the uh, blankets up over my head, which I know for some people is a just nightmare scenario, but for me, it's like, I mean, if I'm honest, it's like sleeping in a womb. It's just to be completely encased is so wonderful and it makes me feel so relaxed, absolutely incredible. Uh, and then the other thing that I do is I use white noise. And so to make sure that there are no little noises that are gonna wake me up in the middle of the night, I have white noise, basically sounds like a fan, um, but from a little machine that plays that consistent sound and that helps me sleep incredibly well. And then because my mind is so frequently in problem solving mode, what I've found is that about 30 minutes before I go to bed, I switch into narrative mode. And so I'm gonna be reading a book, I use Audible, but I'm gonna be listening to a book that shifts my mind out of problem solving mode into narrative mode. And then if I wake up in the middle of the night, I keep next to me three pairs of iPod Pros so that I can put them in, I listen to the book, it makes sure that I don't go into problem solving mode, that I can stay there in narrative mode, and I turn the volume down just to the point where a little bit of pressure on my ear is required to hear them perfectly. And so I'll put that bit of pressure, listen to the story, and then as I fall asleep, that pressure comes off my ear, and now I can barely hear it, and I fall right back to sleep. Now, I will give you the advanced tip, which is don't pick an audiobook that has a bunch of murder in it, because then you wake up to the narrator screaming and yelling, 
and that was waking me up. So I had to learn the hard way that there's a certain type of book that's a good engaging story but doesn't have narration where you know there's yelling and screaming at any point in the story. And yeah, the last thing that I will say about my sleep is that I go to bed at the same time every night, which is 9 p.m. I treat it like a religion. I go to bed every night. At that time, sometimes a few minutes earlier, if I can convince Lisa. And then the second part of that is that I don't set an alarm. So I haven't set an alarm for the last you know, 16, 17 years at this point. So trust me, you can do amazing, incredible things in your life without needing to set an alarm. I get as much sleep as I need. Now I don't have kids, so that is no doubt a big part of how I'm able to maintain that. But the more that if you do have kids, you can sleep closer to their sleep rhythms to make sure that you're getting as much sleep as you need. And let me tell you, if I had kids and I needed to go to bed at 7 p.m., I would go to bed at 7 p.m. So I'm gonna go to bed at whatever time I need to in order to get all the sleep that I need. If you need nine hours, get nine hours. Your brain shrinks in the middle of the night, which basically the inflammation is going down so that the glial system can flush everything out, get rid of any toxins that might be building up in the system, get rid of the amyloid plaques, which are very present in people that have Alzheimer's. Probably doesn't cause Alzheimer's, but nonetheless, it lets you know that it's doing something that we don't necessarily want sticking around. And I said the glial system, and I think I mean the lymphatic system. Somebody will have to fact check me on that because I'm actually not sure which. But the brain shrinks nonetheless and allows you to clear out that system. Um, so being very thoughtful to get as much sleep as you need so that you can enjoy your life. So that on a biological cellular level that you're able to run all your processes. So that you're able to do all the memory consolidation, all the things that go along with the ancillary effects to sleeping and then making sure that you're able to think as clearly, sharply, and quickly as possible. And all of those things come down to the quality of your sleep, the quality of your diet, the quality of your exercise, and your ability to manage your psychological life, which we can do most easily through meditation. So, that in a bundle, my friends, is how you take care of yourself cognitively to make sure that you can deliver an elite level of performance day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. Rule number two is build self-esteem with Bob Proctor. What would you say are some deciding factors that can help someone with their self-esteem? Because you and I are very similar where my childhood, I didn't, I didn't have much confidence in myself or mm -hmm. esteem because I was in the bottom of my class in school because I was you know, had tutors and special needs classes because I just wasn't able to understand it and comprehend that well and felt awkward and goofy in my life. What are some, some things you think people that in their teens or even in their 40s and 50s who don't have confidence yet, what are the things that we can be doing differently to gain confidence, to build self-esteem? Because I think this is one of the key factors of success is believing in yourself. It doesn't matter if the world believes in you, if you don't believe in you. Yeah. What can we start to do to change that? Well, I think a person has to start to study themselves. Most people know very little about themselves. They think they're their body. You're not a body. You have a body. And you have a marvelous mind. And when I first started to study this, I thought, you know, Study in the mind, that's for psychiatrists, psychologists, behavioral scientists. And the man that told me, he said, no, it's not. He says, that's for anybody. That's for little kids. And so I think as we start to understand something about our mind and something about our higher faculties, see, we're, we're all programmed to live through our senses. We go by what we see, hear, smell, taste, touch. Well, I've got a little dog at home that can see, hear, smell, taste, touch. All the animals in the world, they're, they're completely at home in their environment. They blend in. They operate by instinct, which is perfect. Um, we had instinct removed, and we had higher faculties put in our place, in their place. And if we would study these and gain an understanding, your self-image would automatically start to improve. You have perception, the will, reason, imagination, memory, and intuition. Those six faculties will give you the ability to create your own environment. See, we're totally disoriented in our environment. 
where all the other little creatures are completely at home in theirs. And we're, we're disoriented in ours because we can create our own, but we don't know that. School doesn't teach us that. School is more interested in, in the development of your intellect than in the development of awareness. Mm. Like, um, a person doesn't earn $100,000 a year because they want 100 a year. They earn 100 a year because they're not aware of how to earn 100 a month. Awareness is really the key. And when we become aware of who we are and what we've got working for us, you know, marvelous things start to happen to us. And that's really what happened to me. I never went back to school. Um, I, um, I built a very successful company. It operates all over the world. Um, I didn't do it myself. I have a tremendous team of people. I've got a, just an absolute genius of a business partner, a, a woman who's an attorney. I mentioned to you before, you should have her on sometime. You, she, you, you'd be fascinated with her. She's that interesting. But it was a group of people. We've attracted a phenomenal group of people in our company. Mm -hmm. And we're operating now in 91 countries. Wow. Teaching this information. You know, it's, I don't know another company that teaches what we teach. Like I think um, Tony Robbins has probably done more for our industry than any individual. The Secret has probably done more for it as much as Tony has. Um, the movie. Um, but there's, I don't know anybody else teaching what we're teaching. And what we're really doing is teaching people how their mind functions and um, how to expand their understanding of how it operates. Rule number three is know that you matter with Brendan Burchard. Strive and serve free from outcome. Those of you who read any Eastern philosophies or spiritual work, you know, whether it's the Bhagavad Gita, whether it's, you know, Buddhism, whether it is more ancient ways of thinking was the idea was show up, work hard, help other people, but free yourself from the expectation of the outcome. This is hard because a lot of people have mattered, but they didn't get the outcome they thought. So they didn't integrate that they mattered. Does that make sense? They're like, I thought if I did that for other people, I'd become famous. And so they don't feel like they mattered because what they're focusing on is, did I become famous? Did not? No. Then I don't matter. Versus focusing on, I showed up and helped people. Meaning if you're emphasizing the perfect outcome versus engaging in the process, you will rarely feel like you matter. Your focus is on this thing that you can't control or contribute to. And if there's no connection to the, that outcome in your mind, you go, well, I guess I didn't matter. I guess I did all that. I did all that. I didn't matter. I was talking with a mom recently. Um, she has a, uh, a daughter who just turned 22 years old. And for the first 21 years of her daughter's life, her daughter liked her. <laughs> <laughs> and then her daughter turned 22. She doesn't know why, but all of a sudden at 22, this daughter no longer likes mom. And she feels like she doesn't matter. All of a sudden I said, well, did you feel like you mattered five years ago? She goes, yeah. I said, why? Well, my daughter liked me. I said, so your sense of whether or not you matter in life depends on whether or not in this moment today, someone likes you and approves of you. You see how ridiculous that thinking is? So the process of being an amazing mom for 21 years goes out the door. I don't matter because now my daughter don't like me. I did all that for nothing, focusing on an outcome. And most outcomes are immediate. We forget that outcomes are entirely changeable over a period of time. We lose perspective. We zero in on what's wrong today and we feel wrong versus recognizing this woman made incredible choices throughout her life to care for this daughter. She's, she's got enough meaning and mattering points 
to last five lifetimes for parents who are disengaged and don't care. This woman gave so much, but she never gave herself the gift of feeling like she matters. Why? Because people get too attached to the outcomes of life. When you learn to show up and to serve and to do it free from whether or not the world gives you the exact outcome you expected, you start to find more enjoyment in life. When you have more enjoyment in life, you start feeling like it matters. When you feel like you do everything, it doesn't turn out exact and purposeful and perfect. Now it feels like nothing you do matters. And when it feels like nothing you do matters because you don't get the exact outcome you want, and that's your daily reality, no wonder you don't feel like you matter. So this is why even the Buddha taught to strive earnestly, meaning show up, be intentional, renew your enthusiasm, serve, but don't be so attached to how they respond or to what you get. Or to what level you get. You know, people are always like, how do you, Brendan, you've been doing this career a long time. You know, do you ever compare yourself to other people? You know, other people have more likes or more views or whatever. You can talk to my team. I don't think I've ever spoken to my team like, you know, someone else has more views than me. I've been doing this a long time. Since literally the invention of Facebook. Like, listen, I've never had that conversation. I don't care. What I care about is, consistently releasing goodness to the world. What comes back to us, sometimes it turns out, it comes back as a number one New York Times bestselling book. Other times, I don't even make the list. Sometimes I have a video, ma'am, it really takes off. Other times, the one I think would be amazing, no one watched. Guess what? Doesn't make any difference to how I show up. I'm going to show up. I'm going to serve. I'm going to teach. I'm going to coach. I'm going to write. Because I find purpose and meaning in that. And I'm free from the outcome. I'm also humble enough that I've read enough spirituality in my life and studied enough history. I know, and this sounds terrible for some of you, and this is so hard for some of you, and I get it, but, and it might even sound stoic, meaning in stoicism to you, that decades from now, generations from now, the odds that anyone would remember me is so tiny. And guess what? Doesn't bother me at all. Think about that. The odds. I mean, think about even now. How many people, when you think back one, two, and three generations, in your own family, do you know their names? Maybe you go down the street and you recognize some buildings and they got a name on the building. Maybe you got one or two or three characters like that in your hometowns. But when you're going back generations of people, few, I mean, few people can even tell you who invented, look around your room, you probably can't even guess the name of the people who invented the very things all around you. You probably don't even know who invented that. They invented a thing that's in your house. Like in your house, they invented it. You don't even know who invented it, how it worked, how they contributed their whole life to create that thing in your house. You don't even know. And so it's a a very empowering thought to recognize the transience of this world. And the more philosophy or spirituality you understand, it's like, oh, okay. It doesn't mean that there might be multiple dimensions, or maybe you have multiple lives, or maybe there's an all-knowing God and, and you're earning points to go up there. I don't know what your beliefs are, but what I do know is it's almost empowering to recognize what matters is here, now, me showing up and serving now. I'm not attached to the outcome generations from now, nor am I attached to the outcome in tomorrow's social media post. I am going to serve and show up and enjoy now. I'm going to bring some goodness into the world now. And that feels incredible, meaningfully, meaningful to me. Why? Because who decides? Think about that. 
Do future generations decide? Five generations from now? Three generations from now? Is that when, you, when you're when you dead, looking down from on high, floating on your cloud with your blueberries and strawberries and the angels floating around, and you're looking down, and 300 years from now, someone says, oh, she really mattered. You finally now allow yourself to feel it? When are you gonna allow yourself to feel it, babe? When? 10 years from now? When the 22-year-old daughter kind of comes to when she's 30 and realizes how important you were in her life? Like, when? When? If not now, my friend. Also, to make sure you're actually taking action after watching this video, I've designed a special free worksheet just for this video. The worksheet will highlight all of the lessons learned in this video, as well as pull out our three favorite learnings and quotes that will inspire you to actually do something. The worksheet will also give you space to write down what your key takeaways are and your specific plan of action to make sure you're getting results. If you want the worksheet designed specifically for this video, absolutely for free, there's a link in the description below. Go click on it and start building the momentum in your life and your business. I'll see you there. Rule number four is remove limiting beliefs with Mel Robbins. Angie, why is it so easy to fill out limiting beliefs, but almost paralyzing to figure out an alternative, think this, not that? How many of you are having trouble with this? It's very easy to see where you doubt yourself, but it's super hard to come up with the alternative thought that you're gonna substitute. Well, the reason why it's hard is because you actually believe these thoughts. And these thoughts have become patterns and they've become habits and they've become so uh, prevalent in your life that they're almost like the co-host of your life. Um, you know, if you think about it, you are the star of your life, but if the supporting actor is a limiting belief that constantly tells you that you're not good enough or that you're not worthy or that you'll never succeed, then it's no wonder that you believe it because the co-star of your life is your limiting beliefs. And so it's not easy to change your limiting beliefs, but it is simple. And it begins with you identifying them and then substituting them. So the most, uh, I think, effective way of beginning the process of teaching yourself how to identify a limiting belief and then come up with your own substitute positive belief as a way to change the negative pattern in your mind is to use the power of objectivity. So write down all your limiting beliefs. And I'm going to go through this in detail in just a second. Write down all your limiting beliefs. I'm not worthy. I'm not good enough. Nothing works out for me. Nobody's going to love me. Whatever the fuck it is that you think that's, that's bringing you down. And then you can ask yourself this. What would Mel say? If Mel were sitting here across from me, what would Mel say? Another thing you can do. You can write the opposite of what you're thinking. And you may not believe it. It's okay. Because what we're doing is training you in a new pattern. And one of the things that Angie asked is she wanted to know what were my limiting beliefs. So yesterday we sent out this workbook, the Best Decade Ever Toolkit. It's in your email. If you go to the Facebook group, Best Decade Ever with Mel Robbins, it's also listed on the files. You'll find the download for this. Check your junk email if you didn't get it. But um, so my limiting beliefs... So I want to have the number one talk show of the decade. And the number one talk show of the decade right now seems to be Ellen. And so it's interesting because a lot of my limiting beliefs, I think, are provoked by the fact that I'm the newcomer in a space that I have huge dreams of making a mark in and dominating. So one of my limiting beliefs is someone's already done it. How many of you have that one? My dream has already been done. So... My substitute thought, because this feels kind of true, doesn't it? Somebody's already done it. And then my substitute thought, the think this, not that, is, well, they haven't done it my way yet. It hasn't been done by me yet. Do you see what I mean? So somebody else has done it. Okay, I get it. It hasn't been done by me yet. It's, it'll never happen. It'll never happen. How many of you have that limiting belief? It'll never happen. My substitute belief 
It hasn't happened yet. So I'm acknowledging that it hasn't happened, but I'm adding on the yet as a way to keep my mind in the positive. Uh, it didn't happen last time, so it's not going to happen this time. How many of you have that one? Yeah, this is what I say. I wasn't ready then. I'm ready now. You know, because it didn't happen last time because I didn't know everything I know now. I'm ready now. Uh, I don't deserve it. How many of you have this limiting belief? I don't deserve it. My thought is, if I work hard, I'll earn it. Do you see that? So it flips from a statement where I'm bashing my self-worth, I don't deserve it, to a statement about putting in the effort. If I work hard, I'll earn it. Oh, I've got this story that I'm the bad news bears, that I'm literally like the person with the worst equipment and I'm the underdog and I'm underfunded and why does it have to be so hard and why does it seem so much easier for everybody else and blah, 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 blah. And I flip that into I love being underestimated and I love being the underdog. In a very weird way, as much as it exhausts me, it also empowers me. Um, oh, here's a, here's a specific limiting belief. How the f*** am I going to compete with Ellen? I can't compete with Ellen. Um, especially when she's been at it for 20 years, she has uh, the budget of God and uh, an army of people that are supporting her. I mean, there was something she did to announce yesterday on social media that I was so like, oh, of course. And I was so jealous. She announced a partnership with Starbucks where she's encouraging people to pay for somebody's coffee using the Starbucks app behind them in line um, and then take a video of it and upload it. And they're going to bring them on the show. And I was like, oh, will I ever get there? Will I ever get to good, cool stuff like that? And the answer is, yeah, she proves it's possible. And also I can take the 10 years and be like, and in 20 years, I won't even recognize the cool stuff I'll be able to doing if I put in the work. So take that jealousy or somebody else or whatever and say it proves it's possible. Now put in the work. Um, so those are some of my limiting beliefs and that's how you can do it. And by the way, if you can't do that exercise successfully on your own, post in the Facebook group and tell people this is your limiting belief. Can somebody help you come up with a substitute positive belief so that you can think this, not that? Ask somebody in your life to help you. Um, and then what you do is when you find yourself going down the route of that negative thought, it'll never happen. You're gonna five, four, three, two, one, use the five second rule to interrupt the negative belief. And then you are going to insert the positive belief. It hasn't happened yet. Rule number five is invest in yourself with Sadhguru. Did you fall in love with your neighborhood girl anytime? <laughs> no? Okay. Suppose you are sixteen years of age and there's a very pretty girl in the next door. Do you have to focus on her? <laughs> Do you need a commitment? <laughs> no, you have interest. So you're committed, you're focused, you're every damn thing, you're freaked. <laughs> so you need some interest. <laughs> if you get interested in something, everything in you gets focused on that thing, isn't it? Whatever that thing is. But most people, do not know how to find any interest in life unless they're hormone-fired. <laughs> this is like… <clears throat> this is an evolutionary issue. See, every other creature is only interested in that which is either its survival or it's reproductive, that's about it, it's not interested in anything else. A bird, an animal, a monkey, what are they interested in? Something to eat or maybe mating. Beyond that, they have no other interest because these two things are chemically fired. Hunger is chemically fired, hormones are 
chemistry. So this is a certain level of existence, animal existence is like that. You cannot blame them, that's how they are. But for you, a certain evolution happened, not a small amount, not a small amount of evolution. Though today scientists say, between you and a chimpanzee, the DNA difference is only 1.23 percent. But 1.23 percent of what? What they're talking about is from an amoeba to a chimpanzee. If it is 98.77 percent, you are 1.3 percent more. That's not a small thing. I don't really know how they calculate this 1.23 percent, but when you look at some people, it looks like very real <laughs> But when you look at some other people, you cannot believe, you cannot believe that human beings were apes. Yes, there's a lot of argument about it, it cannot be. Both look like that, but anyway, it's a small difference but a huge difference. So if you allow this 1.23 percent to operate within you, you will see you are not chemically fired towards what you want and what you don't want. Why in every spiritual process anywhere in the world, one thing that seems to be commonly there is not because we are against food, some amount of denial of food simply because we don't want to be chemically ruled. Brahmacharya, staying away from food, is not because we want to deny something. We don't want to fall into that category that we become an animal, that we are everything that we want is chemically fired. We want what we want consciously, without the influence of our chemistry. This is why certain days of the month not eating, this is why many other practices, fundamentally we don't want to fall into the animal category because animal category means not something bad, it is just a complete compulsive cyclical process. Now we are looking at <laughs> mukti, liberation. If you are in a cyclical process that you're going around in circles, there's no question of any liberation, isn't it? A circle is a trap. Yes or no? Hmm? Is a circle a trap? Yes. If we make the circle large enough, most people won't know they're going in a circle. They keep going round and round and thinking they're going somewhere. That is what going in circles means. That means you're not getting anywhere. We know if our longings and our focus and our direction of life is chemically fired, either by hunger or hormones, we know that we will not get anywhere. This we figured out. Because of that, we are seeing how we create an interest and a focus and an involvement in something which is not chemically fired desire. If you have to engage people like this or if you have to engage yourself like this, you need uh, some octane going within you. If there is no enough energy, you cannot do this because focus takes energy. If you want to focus on something, what you need is not <laughs> some concentration camp mind, you need energy. With age, energy comes down a bit. If your identity just remains physical, the energy that you had in the body at sixteen, you will not have it at thirty. You have to invest in your intellect, your intelligence, your consciousness, then only you can remain energetic. If you just invest in your body, as you age without knowing what's happening, <laughs> no, I'm doing this because this will also go.
it'll all happen to you. Unless you invest in other aspects, if you just invest in the body, as the physical energy recedes, you will see you lose shape and form and become like that. You have to invest in other things which does not need physical support. Then you will see you can be whatever age and still be vibrantly energetic because your energy is not of the body. If you invest in something else, whatever your age, you will remain energetic. So, you must develop some interest in the yoga. Then you don't have to focus, you will be focused. And rule number six, the last one before some very special bonus clips, is forgive with Brian Tracy. The greatest human goal is peace of mind. And the greatest obstacle to peace of mind is anger and blame aimed at other people. In order to eliminate anger and blame, you have to learn to forgive. And there are four people that you need to forgive if you're really serious about changing your life and learning how to live in the present. The first people you have to forgive are your parents, living or dead. You must absolutely forgive them for every mistake they ever made in bringing you up. At the very least, you should be grateful to them for giving you life. They got you here. If you're happy to be alive, you can forgive them for everything else. Never complain about them again. Many of my seminar participants have phoned or visited their parents after the seminar and told them that they forgive them for everything and for every mistake they ever made bringing them up. Often this simple act of courage and character on your part has had the profound effect on their relationship with their mother or father. From that day onward, they become good friends with their parents, which then lasted for the rest of their lives together. On the other hand, by not forgiving your parents, you remain forever a child. You block your own chance to grow up and become a fully functioning adult. You continue to see yourself as a victim of your parents, a victim of your childhood. And even worse, you keep your negative feelings of inferiority and anger alive inside yourself. If your parents die without your having forgiven them, it can bother you for the rest of your life. The second persons you must forgive are the people from your marriages or relationships that didn't work out. These intimate relationships can be so intense and so threatening to your feelings of self-esteem and self-worth that you can become angry and unforgiving toward these people for years. But remember, you were at least partially responsible for the relationships in your life that didn't work out. Have the personal strength and integrity to say those magic words, I am responsible. And then think of ways that you were responsible for the relationship rather than thinking of reasons why the other person is to blame. Forgive the other person and let him or her go. Say these words, I forgive him or her for everything and I wish him or her well. Each time you repeat this, the negative emotion attached to the memory will diminish, almost like turning down the heat on a pot. It gets cooler and cooler and soon it will be gone forever. Many of my seminar graduates have found that the letter is the key to putting a bad relationship behind them forever. This is a powerful technique that I learned many years ago and that can free you from feelings of anger and resentment almost instantly. It can liberate you from the negativity of a past relationship in a matter of seconds. Here's how it works. You, what you do is you sit down and you write the other person a letter of forgiveness. This letter consists of three parts. First you say, I forgive you for everything you ever did that hurt me. Second, you write out a description or list of every single thing that you're still angry about. Some people write several pages in this, po in this part, what you did, what you said, what you didn't do, and so on, they get it all on paper. And third, you end the letter with these words, I wish you well. You then take the letter to the mailbox and drop it in. Or if you're using email, and I prefer to do it on paper, if you're using email, press send. At that moment, you'll feel a huge sense of relief and you'll be free at last. By the way, don't worry about how the other person might react. This is not your concern. 
Your goal is to free yourself. It's to regain your peace of mind and to get on with the wonderful life that lies ahead of you. Now, the third person you must forgive is everyone else in your life who has ever hurt you in any way. Let them go. Forgive every boss, every business partner, friend or crook or betrayer who has ever caused you grief of any kind. Clean the slate and forgive and forget. Wipe away each of their names and wipe the images off by just saying whenever you think of them, I forgive him or her for everything and I wish them well. I forgive them for everything and I wish them well. You just repeat this statement every time you think of the other person or situation until the negative emotions actually disappear. It's the most amazing darn thing. Again, when you start to say it initially, when you think of the other person and they make you mad, you won't see much of a reaction, but as you keep saying it, I forgive them and wish them well. I forgive them and wish them well. Your temperature goes down and down and down, and like a fire with no fuel, it finally goes cold and all the emotion is gone. The fourth and final person you have to forgive is yourself. You must absolutely forgive yourself for every silly, senseless, wicked, brainless, thoughtless, or cruel thing that you've ever done or said. Stop carrying these past mistakes around with you. That was then, and this is now. Think of it this way. When you did those things in the past that you still feel badly about, you were not the person that you are today. At that time, you were a different person. You were younger and less experienced. You were not your true self as you are today. You were an immature version of the person that you have become with experience. So stop beating yourself up for something that occurred in the past, something that a different person did, not you, and something that you cannot change. Just say the words, I forgive myself for every mistake I ever made. I am a thoroughly good person and I'm going to have a wonderful future. Even better, you can add the words, I love myself unconditionally. When you love yourself unconditionally, you let yourself go. Now, whenever you think of that past event or situation or person that you hurt or did something untoward to, just repeat, I forgive myself completely. And then, get on with your life. Focus on the future rather than the past and don't look back. Look at where you're going rather than where you've been. And finally, if you did something that hurt someone and you still feel badly about it, you can go to that person or write and apologize. Just tell the person you're sorry for what you did or said. Whatever his or her reaction, positive or negative, it doesn't matter. The very act of repentance, of expressing regret, will set you free. When you see people who are noble in spite of their suffering, it is ennobling, it is uplifting. Re like, really, it is. And, um, and it, it's been striking to me, too. People want to be encouraged in that direction. I mean, part of the reason that my lectures, I would say, have been successful to the degree that they have been is because people find them encouraging. Mm -hmm. And that actually seems to work, like it seems to be positive. Because it, it isn't necessarily good news. Well, it seems to be. Yeah. I mean, it isn't necessarily the case that that would be the case, you know, because it could have been that I would have said encouraging things to people. There's more to you than meets the eye, and you're capable of more than you're demanding of yourself. And, you know, if you took on your responsibility and faced the things that you're trying to avoid, that your life would be richer and better and for you and for everyone around you. And the result of that could have been that thousands of people would come to me and say, you know, I gave that a pretty good shot and it, your advice is really awful and everything is, well, seriously, like I took on that responsibility, it just bloody crushed me and I'm way worse off than I was before and everything's gone to hell around me and like, thanks a lot, buddy. And that, and that it's not like that's a completely incomprehensible possibility. But that doesn't seem to be what happens, is what generally happens is that young people in particular, but not only, come to me and say, look, I've been trying to take on more responsibility and to face the things I've been avoiding, and everything is way better. It's like, okay, well, hmm, isn't that something? Maybe and, onto something. Well, then you ask yourself, well, what's the limit of that? Because that's the religious question, fundamentally, is, well, if you took on all the responsibility you could take on, 
and you faced everything that you needed to face, what would you be like? Who would you be? And how would the world transform around you? And well, if, if the partial answer is, well, if I do that a little bit, things get a fair bit better, then the next question might be, well, what if you did that completely? And I don't think that's possible in some sense, right? It's like, you know, perfection is a horizon that always recedes, but it isn't obvious to me what the upper limit of that is, and certainly we do see people, I mean, saints, let's yeah, that's say. Yeah, say, it's a Mother right, Teresa, who, it's a Francis who, of Assisi. Who kind of push the limit, and they, miraculous things happen around them, and maybe in the literal sense, and if not in the literal sense, close enough, you know, for all intents and purposes, and so that's heartening. I mean, I tear myself apart about this in many ways, because I think, Perhaps it's possible to take on too much responsibility and to crush yourself as a consequence. Maybe that's a sin of pride. Who knows, it's certainly possible. But my experience so far has been that when you see people bear their suffering nobly, there's nothing in that but good. That's something. And then when you see people take on more responsibility and decide that they're going to aim up and, and confront their suffering honestly and forthrightly, that their lives get better and the lives of people around them get better too. And so it's, that's very strange as well because it also means that the pathway to less suffering is through suffering, right? And that's kind of, that would be hopeful if the world was constituted that way. It's like, well, there's suffering. How do you make it worse? Run away. How do you make it better? Confront it. Yeah, but it's suffering. It's like, yeah, but it's there. There it is. It's right there. It's a precondition for existence or something like that. And it's like you have something important to do as well. And you confront it. And that's the pathway to transcending it. We had a Thanksgiving where literally we had no food and, and we wouldn't have starved, but we weren't going to have a Thanksgiving dinner. And uh, there was a knock at the door and that knock changed my life because it was someone who delivered food for us. It, it was just a delivery man, the person who actually sent it, uh, didn't acknowledge who they were. And the man said, this is just a gift for you and your family. And my father didn't react very well to it at the time, um, didn't want charity, but out of necessity he took it in. And I just remember at that time thinking to myself, why is it that my father worked so hard? Because he did work, he wasn't unemployed. And yet here we are with no money on Thanksgiving, not even for food. And it's just, my whole life had been that way. And I just, I couldn't understand why we were living on the other side of the tracks. I lived in what I thought was a rich community. It was actually a middle-class community, lower middle-class, but everybody else, we lived right next to the railroad tracks, quite literally. And everyone seemed like living a different lifestyle. And I couldn't understand. And my father, I felt, felt, was as good as their fathers as a person. Why did we have such lack? Why was there such scarcity? Why did they have so much abundance and us not have any? And I really didn't have the answer until I sat in that room with Jim Rohn. And he asked a question. He said, you know, what does it really take to do well financially? What does it take to have real economic abundance? And he said, you must bring value to the marketplace. I'll never forget. And I thought, what the hell is he talking about? Value to the marketplace. And he made it very clear that we all have value in our own souls, but that's not what we get paid for. We also don't get paid for effort. We don't get paid for our time. We get paid to find a way to add value. And the question he asked at the time was, how is it possible that some people earn twice as much money as you do? Or four times or five times or 10 times as much money in the same amount of time. And he said, the answer is because they found a way to add more value. That is the secret to abundance. Do more for others than anyone else on earth. And if you can do that, you can build a brand, you can build a company, you can build a life, you can build friendships that are beyond compare. And so that simple little philosophy was really simple. And he went a little deeper. He was very specific. He said, you know, if you look at it, I remember at the time he said, if you work for McDonald's in those days, he said, you make $2.50 an hour. And I remember he said, you know, somebody's working, making $2.50 an hour and they're barely surviving. Today, working at McDonald's, you make $8 an hour by contrast, with a little inflation. But this is 1977. And he said, so why do these people make so little? And somebody, that, he gave the example back then of the gentleman who was uh, the head of Disney and he's made $52 million in the same year. One person's making 250 an hour, somebody else makes 52 million. 
He said, how is that possible? Isn't that fair? Isn't that unfair? And I remember at the time him pausing and saying, well, anybody can learn within an hour how to really do the numbers and use a cash register. In fact, today, you don't even know the numbers. You just push a button with a picture on it, right? So anybody can do that. It's not being disrespectful. So there's not a lot of added value. In fact, soon robotics will probably take most of that over because it's, it's not something that expands the human spirit. It's not a complex task that makes us expand or grow and offer something. But he said, you know, the guy that figured out how to turn Disney around with having trouble is worth $52 because he's bringing joy and happiness and love and laughter to millions and millions of people. So if you help millions of people, you're going to do well. In the Bible, it says, if you wish to become great, learn to become the servant of many. Which, as Jim used to say, is, you know, that means there's nothing wrong with wanting to be great. But greatness comes from serving a large number of people or at a deep level, one of the two. And so you look at it today, and today the story is the same. You work at McDonald's, it's $8 an hour, and I just got finished writing a book where I interviewed 50 of the most successful financial people on earth that started with nothing. And you look at a guy last year, David Tepper was the highest paid hedge fund guy. He got paid $3.5 billion last year. Now that looks like incredibly unjust experience. You know, it's insane. It's insane to think that that man's going to make 3.5 and someone else is going to make 15000 a year at $8 an hour, basically. How, how could you justify that? Well, if you find a way to add more value, you can earn more and you can be abundant. Now, he figured a way to get a 40% return for people. In a world where most people are putting their money in a savings account, getting 33 basis points, one-third of 1%. One if he got people a 1% return, he'd be having 300% more value but he's adding 12,000% more value for his investors. These people have taken their money and they're able to do things for their families, for their businesses, for the causes they care about because he's growing it at a multiplied level because he developed this incredible set of skills. And how did he do it? The way Jim Rohn teaches. He learned to work harder on himself. He learned to master skills no one else had that could add value to others. So introducing you to Jim Rohn in abundance, I just wanna mark out that you can earn 10 times more, 20 times more, 100 times more in the same amount of time, if you work harder on yourself than anything else, if you find a way to do more for others than anyone else, and then it goes beyond money. Then it goes to understanding abundance as an emotion, like love, like joy. It's the most amazing thing. The more of it that we give, the more of it we experience inside. The beautiful thing about monk life is half the day is self, and half the day is service. That's yeah. how you're taught to live. Okay. So the morning hours are for you to fill yourself. It's almost like putting on mental, emotional, and physical armor. Like that's what a morning routine is. Our days are tiring. Our days are busy. Yeah. Our days are draining. Well, guess what? If you didn't put your armor on in the morning, boy, oh boy. and you're going out to battle, how many knives are gonna cut you? Mm. How many swords are gonna pierce you? Mm. How many wounds are you gonna come home with? How many of you come back home feeling wounded? Mm. I come back home feeling wounded sometimes, Often. but guess what? If you put your armor on in the morning, a warrior would never go out onto a battlefield. And life can be a battlefield. Mm. Work can be full of conflict sometimes. Mm. Your relationships can be damaging sometimes. Your friendships can be toxic sometimes. So we are warriors in one sense. Sure. And so without wearing that, so for me a morning routine is putting on emotional armor, Whoa. which is meant to protect you for the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. And that way, even if you do get pierced, or you do get popped, or you do get cut, yeah. you're protected. Mm -hmm. And I know that when I, my morning routine is at its best, I feel protected. I know exactly. Yeah. Whereas when my morning routine is weakened, mm -hmm. I feel weak. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the morning routine, as I get strategic about it, mm -hmm. there's two principles you have to know. Location has energy and time has memory. If you do something in the same place every day, that place now holds that energy. And this is huge, like it's, it's just so big and I'm, I'm grateful for that reaction because Whoa. people don't realize how, how powerful this is. Like when I meditated in temples mm. that were 5,000 years old in South India, mm. it was easier to meditate because people have been meditating there for thousands of years. Wow, it's so good. And so when you find a space in your home, and even if you've got, like I lived in a 500 square foot apartment in New York mm. four years ago, mm. and I just had a tiny corner which I dedicated to my sacred practices. Mm. So if you, you don't have to have a big home to do this, you don't have to be wealthy to do this, you can find just a corner in your home wow. that you dedicate as your meditation space or your reflection space. So first thing, location has energy. Second thing, awesome. 
Time has memory. Mm. And this is something that people underestimate. When you do something at the same time every day, you remember it and time remembers it. That's why we struggle to work out at different times every day. It's why we struggle. Like, why do we feel hungry at the same time every day? Generally, we feel hungry at the same time. Most people, if you've got a regulated diet, you will feel hungry. You will feel tired at the same time every day. You will look towards that Coke can or that sugar or that chocolate bar at the same time every day. And so when you're meditating at the same time, if you're exercising at the same time, so what I recommend to people <laughs> wow, wow. is your morning routine needs four aspects and it's simple and I call it time. It's about making time in the day. Okay. So time stands for T-I-M-E. T stands for thankfulness. There needs to be, even if it's five minutes, five minutes of thankfulness, of gratitude every single morning. And that has to be gratitude that's specific. It can't be gratitude that's generic. So generic gratitude is something that anyone could be grateful for. Oh, I'm grateful for the sky. I'm grateful for air. I'm grateful for water. That's cool, but it's generic gratitude. Specific gratitude is I'm grateful for the fact that I have someone calling me this morning. I'm grateful for the fact that I can still call my parents. I'm grateful for the fact that I have this person in my business who is having such an impact. I'm grateful, you know, it's specific. Specificity. Yeah, so thankfulness. Second one is insight. I think this is one thing that a lot of people are missing, which I recommend people listening to you. It's like podcasts, books, and, and make it easier for yourself. If you get this book, leave it open on your bedside table. Leave it open on your kitchen table. Leave it open on your dining table. I guarantee you, you will read more and what you read will speak to you. And I think people underestimate that, that literally like when you have it open and you'll just flick to a chapter randomly and you'll pick up one line, it will impact you and it will speak to you. So insight, you need insight every day. M is meditation. And I believe meditation is different for different people. As monks, we did walking meditations. We did beach meditations. We did visualizations. We did breath work. Find your meditation practice. I give a ton in the book. And fourth, obviously exercise, which you can speak to even more than I can. Mm -hmm. I exercise to keep fit. You look amazing too though. Yeah, yeah. But it's an exercise. Everyone needs to find five minutes a day, 15 minutes a day of exercise. Mm -hmm. The brain only learns by, only, we only see reality based on pattern recognition. I memorized your face, now I know Lewis. And if the pattern matches, I know. But if you're creating a future, and you're not clear on that future, and you want all these things, but you haven't addressed all those circuits and behaviors and emotions and chemicals of the past, you won't recognize the pattern. You'll walk right past the relationship, you'll never see it. So. So I think that there's wow. the preparation for the relationship, the overcoming, and overcoming, and overcoming, and overcoming, and overcoming, and becoming, Ooh. all of a sudden now says, I am worthy. And the universe only gives us what we think we're worthy of receiving. So when you're worthy to receive, it's not gonna be on match.com when you're looking at body parts and whatever else. <laughs> this is gonna be like, Ka-ching. An like, energy like, connection. Wow. Yeah. Like, that came out of nowhere because <laughs> when you're in survival and you're in separation and you're in lack and you're forcing and controlling and trying to predict outcomes, you're matter trying to change matter. And of course, it's going to take time for this to happen because you're creating a three-dimensional reality and everything in three-dimensional reality takes time. Mm -hmm. But when you're creating from the heart, with a coherent brain and a coherent heart, and you got that 5G Wi-Fi signal, it's, it's not like you go anywhere now. <laughs> the experiences are coming to, you're drawing the event to you. So, mm. so we spend a lot of time bonding with our future emotionally. I have colleagues of mine who look at our, our data on oxytocin and they're like, uh, listen, oxytocin levels go up during, a, you know, when I'm, when I'm in, a, in a relationship, the honeymoon stage of relationship and it, a monogamy is created because of those chemicals or uh, a female mammal is bonding with our offspring. That's exactly right. I want our people, our students to bond and fall in love with their future just like they do with somebody else. And when you're bonded to your future, no person, no circumstance, no thing is going to remove you from it. So then, if you fall from grace during the day, then the next question is, what person, what circumstance caused me to disconnect from my love in the future? Mm. And let me rehearse in my mind, if I have that same circumstance,
I'm going to overcome it. Mm. Open your eyes and be in the initiation of life mm. and stay in that place and just yeah. know that your future is going to happen. So, so being able to activate the heart and breathe in there and get the body out of survival and start working with it like it feels safe enough to create. Once energy makes it here, you're going to get some really good ideas. Yeah. You're gonna see things you never thought of seeing. You're gonna feel things you never thought you'd feel. And the, the, the images that you're creating, what are they doing? The thoughts that you're creating, they're making more of those chemicals. And now you're feeling more of the, the feeling of your future before it happens. You're, you're giving your body a sampling. Mm. A taste of the future before it's happened. Keep doing that enough times, and that feeling is going to become very familiar to you. There was a, a researcher uh, out of Yale University that, uh, in the 1940s, that was studying electromagnetic fields around living organisms. And in the 1940s in Yale, at Yale University, nobody was doing this, and he was a, a vitalist. He wanted to understand the unseen fields around living organisms. So he started studying eggs. All kinds of eggs. Chicken eggs, you know, swallow eggs, reptile eggs, snake eggs, salamander eggs, there's all kinds of eggs. And he was using a magnetometer and what he found was what 100% of the time, no matter what egg he measured, the positive charge was always at the head mm -hmm. and the negative charge was always at the tail. Well, if you have positive charge on one end and negative charge on the other end, you got an external electromagnetic field called a magnetic field. That's a magnet, right? What happens with human beings is every thought has a frequency. Every thought produces a chemical. So if you keep obsessing about your lack, your lack of finances, your lack of time, your lack of energy, lack, 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 and, and those thoughts. I don't have this, I, I don't need know, this, What, I want what are this. the chemicals you're feeding your body? You're taking thought, it's producing a frequency, and that frequency in the form of chemistry is storing that thought emotionally right in your second center. You feel guilty, you feel unhappy. The moment you feel unhappy, then you generate more thoughts equal to that feeling, which makes more chemicals, and you keep taking energy from the brain and storing it in the body. If you react to people in your life and you feel anger, frustration, whether it's traffic, the news, whatever it is. Parents, you, parents whatever, girl, what, you're drawing from this field, this electromagnetic field, you're tapping that resource and you're making chemistry out of it and the field shrinks. So now, mm. by doing that and living in survival, the body no longer is a magnet. So now you have very little energy in the brain. In fact, 5% of the energy is in the brain. Then 95% is stored in the body. Now the body's been conditioned emotionally. So a lot of energy in the body, very little in the brain. I talk to so many smart, fantastic, ambitious, idealistic, hardworking kids and they're right out of college, they're in their entry level jobs and I'll ask them, how's it going? And they'll say, I think I'm gonna quit. And I'm like, why? And they say to me, I'm not making an impact. I'm like, you know you've been here eight months, right? <laughs> they treat the sense of fulfillment or even love like it's a scavenger hunt, like it's something you look for. My millennial friends, they've gone through so many jobs, they're either getting fired, I mean it was mutual, or they're quitting because they're not making an impact or they're not finding the thing they're looking for, or they're not feeling fulfilled, as if it's a scavenger hunt. Love, a job you find joy from, is not something you discover. It's not like, I found love, here it is. I found a job I love, that's not how it works. Both of those things require hard work. You are in love because you work very hard every single day of your life to stay in love. You find a job that brings you ultimate joy because you work hard every single day to serve those around you and you maintain that joy. It's not a discovery. But the problem is the sense of impatience. It's as if an entire generation is standing at the foot of a mountain. They know exactly what they want. They can see the summit. What they can't see is the mountain. This large, immovable object. That doesn't mean you have to do your time. That's not what I'm talking about. Take a helicopter, climb, I don't care, but there's still a mountain. Life, career fulfillment, relationships are journeys. The problem is this entire generation has an institutionalized sense of impatience and do they have the patience to go on the journey to maintain love, to feel fulfilled, or do they just quit and onto the next, dump and onto the next, ghost and onto the next. And by the way, ghosting 
means the lack of skill to have a confrontation. You date somebody for six months, eight months, and then just stop replying. You just delete them from everything. <laughs> now, for the person who's doing the ghosting, oh, that's certainly easier than a confrontation. But the person on the receiving end of the ghosting, it's like there's a death. They're suddenly shunned. There's panic. They call out, they're worried. They call out, they're worried. They think it's you, they think it's them. Do you have any idea the destruction that we reap on people by ghosting them? And then because there's the lack of social skills to call out and ask for help, they internalize and it makes them feel awful to the point. At the worst, they will kill themselves. Slightly one level down, they'll get depressed. But the lowest level that we can hope for is they will go through life, and I'm not talking about ghosting, I'm talking an entire generation, that if we don't fix this, we'll go through life where everything's just fine. My friendships are fine, my work is fine. You know, same old, same old. Nothing's ever amazing. And the scavenger hunt continues. And then you go to the fourth observation, the most egregious of all of them, environment. We're taking a generation that has lower self-esteem. We're taking a generation that has a lack of coping mechanisms to deal with stress. We're dealing with a generation that wants all those things fixed immediately, and we're placing them in work environments that values money more than people. Do you know that most of the business philosophies, most of the business theories that we embrace and see as standard today are not standard. They're theories left over from the 80s and 90s. The concept of shareholder supremacy was a theory proposed in the late 1970s. It was popularized in the 80s and 90s. The concept of using mass layoffs to balance the books did not exist in the United States prior to the 1980s. It did not exist. It became popular in the 80s and 90s. The 80s and 90s were boom years. Anyone could make money. Relative peace, a kinder, gentler, cold war. And so all of the business theories that were put forth were very, very selfish and all about enriching ourselves. And they worked for those times. But these times are different. These are not peaceful times. These are not boom years. This is, there's globalization and the internet which has now made everything vastly more complicated and those theories do not work anymore. Worse, they're having side effects. It's really bad. Because what we do is we destroy corporate cultures. The idea of using mass layoffs, can you imagine sending someone home and saying, I'm sorry, I can no longer provide for our family because the company missed its arbitrary projections this year. That's what we're doing. That's like a, a coach prioritizing the needs of the fans over the needs of the players, hoping to build a great team. It doesn't work. We dismantled things like the Glass-Steagall Act. Glass-Steagall was passed after the Great Depression to prevent another Great Depression from happening. It was dismantled in the 80s and the 90s in the name of profit, okay? Do you know how many stock market crashes we had between the Great Depression and the dismantling of Glass-Steagall? The answer is zero. And since they dismantled Glass-Steagall, we had 87, the dot-com crash, 2008. We've had three stock market crashes because we've moved the safety mechanisms that prevent stock market crashes from happening, all in the name of individual advancement and profit. And these are the corporate cultures we've built. Corporate cultures that value numbers over people. And they are not standard business practices. They are new, and they are broken, and they are dangerous. And we're asking a young, wonderful, ambitious, amazing generation that needs us to work in these environments. Whether we like it or not, we have to take responsibility for the bad hand that you've been dealt. It is up to the companies to create an environment in which you can build your self-confidence. It is up to the companies to create an environment in which you can learn coping mechanisms and learn how to build strong, close relationships with people with whom you work, that you will eventually love and sacrifice to see that they gain. It is in these environments that we will learn the patience and the hard work that it takes to find fulfillment in our lives, to find a sense of purpose, a sense of joy, Yes, it's all fine and good that 
My generation and older generations say to you things like, well, you're the future leaders. We're the leaders now. We're the ones in control of the corporate environments now. And we're making your lives worse. I don't want you to jump from job to job to job to job. You will never find what you're looking for. It's not a scavenger hunt. I don't want you to go from relationship to relationship to relationship. What I want you to do is stand up and demand that the places in which you work lead you properly. Nobody wants to wake up in the morning and be managed. We want to wake up in the morning and be led. And we have a total leadership crisis in America. Politics is just the mirror reflection. We get the politicians we deserve. We're the divided ones. We're the selfish ones. We're the broken ones. We're the ones who would sooner sacrifice somebody else so that we may gain. It's us. And until we're willing to do the hard work of repairing the world around us, our country, our politics, our businesses will not fix. Be the change you want to see in the world. One of my favorite quotes, Mahatma Gandhi. If you're not happy with something, you're not happy with a situation, you, f you fix it. That's why entrepreneurs are going to solve all the problems. Now, as much as there's government and big business, I think it's entrepreneurs, it's us. We're going to solve all the world's problems because we see a problem and we want to fix it. We want to solve it. That's what we do. That's the most exciting part of being an entrepreneur is that you're not waking up and driving to some job that you hate where the work you're doing does not matter, has no meaning, and instead you get to do something that is actually gonna to touch somebody's life and that is meaningful to you, right? You get to pick, you get to decide, you get to choose. And we're trying to make the world a better place. We're gonna make money doing it too, but mission first, purpose first, and then making money along the way in service of others. And it's in that combination of what you love doing with what brings value to other people that you have a successful business. Part of that then becomes being a leader as well. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs struggle with being a leader because at the beginning, we are just managing ourselves. And that's hard enough, right? It's like, have you had a hard time managing yourself? Have you had a hard time sticking to your routines and keeping to your motivation and staying strong in the things that you say you're gonna do? Like self-management, self-leadership is hard enough. Now we're gonna go off and lead other people as well. And where do we learn about leadership? Where, if we don't go to school for this, we don't have programs, we don't ha probably have great mentors to help us. If you had jobs in the past, or maybe you had a job right now, you probably don't have the greatest leaders around you. Most people suck at it. But it doesn't have to be extremely difficult. And it took me a long time to get used to it and get better at it, and I'm still learning and improving. But we've got almost 40 people on the team now, and when people ask me what's my, defini my definition of leadership, it's I want people to win more than I want them to win with me. And so the key becomes wanting the humans that are on your team to win as humans more than you want them to win with you. That you can have this little disconnection. Obviously they have to do the work if they're gonna work with you. But sometimes the best thing for them to do is to move on. Not because they're not doing their job, but because it's the best thing for them. And so when I connect with the people on my team, it's always trying to figure out where do they want to go? What do they want to learn? What do, they, what do they want to improve on? And I see everybody as running parallel paths with me. So the people around you, the people, even us right now, what we're doing right now, this is a parallel path. You've decided to watch this video. I decided to record this video and we're sharing this moment in time. And maybe you never watch another Evan Carmichael video again. Maybe you end up watching all my videos and we end up being partners on some future business. Who knows, you know, maybe I'm seeing you every day in the future. But as of right now, we're on this parallel path together. And when somebody's with you, walking down that parallel path, the goal of a great leader, I think, should be to try to make that person leave better than how they came in, right? Have, have you ever heard the expression, um, or maybe it's just something my grandfather used to tell me about, you know, when you go to a hotel, or you go to a, a new city or you go to a new event, they always try to leave the place better than when you came. You know, and hopefully that's our goal for life, you know, in this life. We try to leave the world a little better than how it was when we came in. And so if you take that approach to leadership, that when you're with the people on your team, and maybe it's for a week on some really short internship, maybe it's for a year, maybe it's for five years, ten years, maybe it's for their entire life with you, that they have left a little bit better than when they came in because they got to hang around you. And 
not taking it as an ego play, like I'm gonna make this person's life better because I am so amazing. It's more out of care, genuine care for the people on your team. And I think when we're first hiring, we suck at it. Most entrepreneurs suck at hiring. Most entrepreneurs, their first employee is not with them, you know, a year, two years, three years later because they hired the wrong person, they have no idea how to manage that person. It's not that that person sucks, it's more that you know, you don't have the skill set, we don't have the skill sets at the beginning to know how to even find the right person, let alone manage them. And so, you know, we, that's a skill that we have to develop. But I think it just starts with genuinely caring about the people on your team. That yes, they have to get the work done, right? There's a job that has to get done. But how we often think about it is more from a selfish perspective as I need to get this stuff off my plate, right? You're overloaded with work, right? Who's over, are you overloaded with work? We're overloaded with work. So I gotta hire somebody to take this off my plate so I don't have to deal with that ever again and it frees up my time to go and do other stuff. Right, sound familiar? Listen, at the beginning when you bring on team, it takes more time. It takes more time than it frees up because you have to train them, you have to listen to them, you have to care for them, you have to answer their questions. If you treat them like a robot or a monkey, they're not going to stick with you. You're going to constantly be hiring and firing and hiring and firing. You're going to be massively frustrated and overwhelmed. And a lot, of, a lot of entrepreneurs get stuck in that cycle where, has this happened to you? You hire somebody, you know, it looks great on paper. You're so excited for it to go. And then it doesn't work out a couple months later. And then you decide, you know what? I'm just going to do it all myself, right? Uh, I know I can get it done. I'm just going to do it all myself. Does that happen to you? That is not the path to building a, a movement. You know, you can have a great little solo business for yourself, but that's not how you change the world. That's not how you realize your potential. That's not how you have the impact that you know you're capable of having. You know, you have to have people around you. If you've got a big mission, if you don't have a big mission, it's just, it's just you, cool, go for it. But if you've got a big mission, then it needs to be team. And that becomes a skill set that you have to pick up and learn. And so leadership for me is, again, caring about people as humans more than caring about them winning with you. It's about discovering what they want to learn and grow and improve at, and you being a vehicle to help them do that. And it's surprising how often you can find things that support them and support you. Not all the time. I remember having one guy on my team who his dream was to be a baker. Like, well, I, I don't have an interest in opening up a bake shop right but ultimately you should you should leave us and go do your passion because because i can't help you inside of this job until i open a bake shop that can really support you in what you want to do and so even though he wanted to stay he was staying more out of fear and insecurity than actually doing something that he was deeply passionate about so i gave him till the end of the year if it was you know summer so give him to the end of the year to Okay, you're, as of the end of the year, you, you're out and you have to go find a job. I love you, but you have to go find something that is in line with your dream. Because you staying here is, is safe and is actually squashing your dreams. You have to go do your thing. And so, you know, he had to go and move on. And was appreciative for it and giving him time, not like, okay, you're fired next week. And then you have other people though, and usually you can find something inside of what they care about. So the, the amount of people who I've met on my team who then, they wanna learn graphic design, or they wanna learn Photoshop, or they wanna learn uh, copywriting, or they wanna learn how to come up with good titles, or they wanna learn better communication skills, or they wanna learn, they, they have their lists of like the things that they wanna learn. It's like, cool, as long as there's something that we've got that can help you with that, some kind of program, some project, something that can also bring value to the company, then let's do it. Because when people are working on the things that they feel like they're growing in and they're learning in, they're gonna, it, it's just a good thing to do because it's, it's from the heart, you know? And when they feel connected to your heart, everybody's happier and more productive. But it's also just good business strategy. If you wanna just put your XO business strategy hat on, it's, it's great, this is how karma becomes practical. If somebody's engaged and they feel like they're learning and they're growing and they're improving, you're gonna get the best of them versus if they feel bored 
and stuck and learning nothing new, right? That's what most people do in their jobs. And honestly, the bar for leadership is so low. It's so low. Most people wake up and drive to that job that they hate. So all you have to do, to be honest, to be their best boss is probably just to not be a bad boss. You don't have to be a great boss. You just have to not, not be a bad boss. You just have to treat somebody like a normal human being and actually have a little bit of care and compassion and curiosity to see them win in life. You do that, you're already probably their best boss of all time. I think that's a pretty low standard, but it's a great starting point <laughs> to then be able to say, hey, no, I want, I want this person to have come out of my organization, whether that's in a month or a year or 10 years from now, a better human because they were with us. And it's totally possible. It's just a mindset shift that these people are on your team because they have something to prove as well and they want to learn and it's not just about you saving your time and dumping stuff off of your plate and giving it to somebody else so it can be all delegated away. It's that you are a leader and you care about people and you want to see them win and you're responsible for making sure that they get pushed outside their comfort zone. You got a big mission inside you. It's a huge mission. And you can't do this alone. And you may not have the skills yet to be the leader that you want to be. Maybe not yet, but you've got a big heart. And honestly, that's the biggest skill that you ever need. Because you made it this far in a video, I want to celebrate you. Most people start and don't finish. Most people never actually follow through. Most people say they want something, but they don't ever do the work to actually get it. But you are different. You are special. Believe Nation, you made it here all the way to the end and I love you. So it's a special celebration. If you put a hashtag believe down in the comments below on this video, I will showcase you and celebrate you somewhere on the screen in a future video because you are awesome. If you want to commit to winning in life, check the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe and I'll see you there. Get clear on what you want. What do you want? Make it super clear. You can't just want a better life. What does that look like? Get super clear on what it is that you are going after. Write it down. One sentence.